I'm just going to wrap up before T then. So we're going to go from Iron Age through to the industrial period, industrial archaeology. So we're really talking 18th, 19th, early 20th century here, and very much a, a period of data overload in terms of number of sites, in terms of fines, in terms of manufacturing processes, wherever you happen to be in the UK. The examples I'm dealing with here for the next 20 minutes uh, relate to North West England, but they could equally apply um, across, across the board, really. So I'm going to look at this problem of, is it too much data? Um, I'm also going to touch upon the people involved in working and thinking about this period. And then I've got two case studies uh, which deal with uh, synthetic data in slightly different ways. So there's a, uh, I'm going to talk very briefly about the industrial chapter for the Northwest Regional Research Framework, which was originally done in 2006 7 and then updated uh, in a prolonged fas fashion because of wretched COVID between 2017 and 2022. And then I'm just going to finish off with a few slides that take, uh, rather like our, our previous slide, uh, speaker, just, just take one, one topic, which is workers' housing, and, and looking at some themes from that based upon more than 30 separate uh, developer-funded uh, interventions into the landscape of Manchester. Key issues, time, money. So that up front, first of all, everybody's touched upon the same thing. Um, too much data. Uh, the, the industrial period is, uh, is, is one of those segments of post-medieval historical archaeology where we can see that, that, that huge transformation from a rural agrarian-based society to a manufacturing urban-based society. We have lots and lots of new sites. We have lots of existing site types that suddenly become much, much bigger and complicated. We have uh, material culture that undergoes a revolution, actually going back to the late medieval period. And we've been grappling with how to deal with this for about 50, 60 years. So um, if you want an overview, a synthesis of manufacturing processes, go to that CBA book there on uh, industrial archaeology, a handbook. Other, other books are available. Um, but uh, we're dealing all the time with how do we capture knowledge about the particular period, both in terms of manufacturing processes, urban development, rural development, uh, and material culture. And although we might think, well, industrial period, it's all about trains and planes and, and, and canals and factories, there's a huge amount of, of, of new material from developer funding that changes our perceptions, both locally, nationally, and internationally. So um, to, to, just to think about the problem with industrial sites, we, we've got 10 World Heritage Sites in the UK. Uh, which are industrial-based. That's a third of all the World Heritage Sites we have in the UK. We have a volume of developer-funded work, uh, which broadly has increased um, year on year, not always, to recessions um, being noted, from 1990, from the advent of developer funding, from PPG-16. Um, and at least two-thirds of all the developer-funded grey literature war, uh, reports that you will uh, deal with mention post-medieval industrial uh, period material in some way. Some, a lot of that material in a very minor way, but much of that material in a, in a very substantial way. So it's, it's one of those huge amounts of data that is quite often just, just noted, might be a few a handful of few post-medieval uh, pieces of pot, or it might be uh, something more substantial. But it is, it is prevalent wherever developer-funded um, sites take place. And just to sort of ele uh, illustrate this, when we updated the Northwest Regional Research Framework for the Historic Environment, rebranding it uh, a few years ago, uh, we tried to come up with heat maps for each period. I don't think Rachel's in the room because she did this work. Um, Oh, thank you, Rachel, at the back. She probably still bears the scars. Um, so we, we've focused 
on trying to do a heat map of activity for uh, research done between 2006 and 2018, I think it was, 2017. Um, and it was very difficult to map because there was so much material. So just for instance, in Greater Manchester, uh, Salford University's archaeological unit uh, undertook 319 uh, piece, separate pieces of work in an eight-year period that included industrial... 70% um, sort of, of those included post-1550 sites. Um, over uh, uh, you know, my old unit, University of Manchester, between uh, 94 and 2009, over 70% of the sites they looked at, and that was on a regional basis, again included post-1550 work. And just looking at Greater Manchester and the historic environment record, there are 2000, over 2,000 developer-funded reports available in the GMAU, uh, well, GMAU GMAS archive, um, most of which have industrial material in them. So that's a huge uh, amount of material to deal with. So a heat map is one way to, to think about uh, these kind of problems and, and the heat map on the right for the northwest England has all sorts of problems itself but it does give an indication of the the sort of spread of activity just for one segment of this revised research framework just for the um, industrial period of the 18th 19th and early 20th century which of course is enough to put many people off quite rightly uh, and then we've, we've ha had mention of academic journals um, this is a summary of some material published between 1990 and 2016, which is developer-funded material in two academic journals, Post-Medieval Archaeology and Industrial Archaeology Review, which is produced by the Association for Industrial Archaeology. And you see here uh, the volume of material. Um, the volume of material is not huge. I mean, I mean it's, it, it, it's reasonable, uh, but it, it, it's not huge. We're talking about something under 100 articles. And he does focus on some very classic uh, sites like glassworks and keys and wharfs and uh, textile mills. But there are other things in here as well. So salt works, for instance, rural uh, buildings, chemical works, um, brick making, stuff that may not get into the literature as much as it should. So there is a sort of steady stream perhaps more a trickle, developer-funded stuff running into the academic literature. But what that really says is that the, the grey literature is where you have to go, understandably, to, to try and grasp the uh, your synthetic overview, which is what we did for the Northwest Regional Research Framework. We did that back in 05, 06, and then the, uh, the volume we, we revised in uh, 2017, 18, 19, and 2020, uh, we did again. Um, and we had a lot more material available to us because ADS was far more advanced uh, by uh, sort of 15 years on. So, um, at, and when we also had access to uh, lots of online material courtesy of the uh, regional HERs and the universities. Uh, and so we're able to say, for instance, that there are over four thousand grey literature reports deposited with local planning authorities across the region between 2006 and 2020. And there are over 900 books and articles published for the North West in that period. Now those deal with all periods, um, not just the industrial, but, but uh, as Stuart mentioned at the beginning, it does demonstrate the size of the problem that we we are dealing with and one of the th things we decided to do with the regional fr research framework was to keep to the period boundaries we had uh, but to have a sort of a a, a panel of people uh, which i'll come back to in a moment uh, contributing to that process so uh, so in terms of who's generating this material well we all know who's generating the material but it's worth bearing it in mind and, and emphasizing it much of this material, vast majority of this material for the industrial period now comes from developer-funded archaeology. Each of uh, This is um, shamelessly nicked from the CIFA website showing you the uh, um, independent consultants and, and 
um, registered archaeological organisations across the UK, every single one of those organisations will deal with a site at some stage in a 12-month period that has industrial period on it. Many practices dealing with industrial uh, material on a, on a weekly basis. Um, we have the voluntary sector, which has been analysed and captured by the Council for British Archaeology um, for, many, uh, for many years with some key reports and also by Historic England, who back in 2015 looked at the value of research done by historical societies, not archaeology societies, but historical societies. And um, it, back in 2016, there were around 600 independent in, um, archaeology uh, so, 600 independent industrial archaeology and heritage museums in um, in the in England alone. Another 200 across uh, across England, Wales, uh, Wales, Scotland, and Northern uh, Ireland. So uh, all of whom have volunteers doing research. So again, this is a big resource to uh, to pull on. Uh, CBA reckons over a thousand. Uh, societies uh, sometime between 2009 and, and, and 2016. And just in case you're wondering where those 600 industrial archaeological sites and museums open to the public and preserved are, there they all are. That's England, sorry, can't do Wales or Scotland, but there's another, and Northern Ireland, but there's another 200 there. So you can start to see we're building up lots and lots of different people involved in looking at the industrial period with lots and lots of different data sets uh, and also lots and lots of different uh, agendas. Um, that includes the period societies. I've mentioned the AIA. I've mentioned uh, post med uh, SOC. Uh, there's the Railway and Canal Historical Society. Council of British Archaeology mentioned. There's, there's CHAT and there are various other groups working in this industrial period. A um, bit difficult to mention universities in a consistent way in this period, uh, for this industrial period. So I'll, I'll, ju I'll just leave it at that. Uh, so, on to, on, that's the size of the problem. There's a huge amount of data. There's lots of people doing individual bits uh, or perhaps doing lots of material. Um, but there there's, has been a problem with pulling that all together. Um, CBA uh, recognising that by publishing the handbook as a, as a sort of first step in that process. So I'm just going to take you into two case studies. So a bit more about the Northwest Regional Research Framework, which was this audit of knowledge, uh, really between 2006 and 2020. So we got the first version and then we updated with the second version, hence the move to historic environment from archeology span as a sort of uh, branding. And the idea was that this is, this is gonna be used by heritage planners, conservation offices, uh, heritage professionals, as well as the research community. And that, that was sort of set out from the very uh, beginning. And an important part, therefore, of this process was, uh, if you like, cooperation and co-creation, bringing all those groups I've just mentioned working in the industrial period together. Now, that was true for all the period sections uh, that the research framework looked at. Uh, but we, we held uh, six... Um, community involvement sessions uh, looking at the database and the research questions in 17 and 18 and that involved 120 people across the region both professionals and volunteers um, commercial archaeologists academic archaeologists museum ar archaeologists we were uh, and architects and landscape professionals as well uh, and you can see some of the some of the interaction in process here at uh, the session at Chester Cathedral in 2017. With uh, on the on the on the wall there are all the research questions from the original research framework, which we went through and reevaluated in terms of the current knowledge of the people in the room, and that ended up with a whole series of new research questions which of course ought to be a way into thinking about how we can summarize and synthesize specific elements of whichever period we're looking at, in this case, the industrial period. Um, we probably, probably over-egged it with the industrial period because we ended up with 108 questions, which is probably too many. But there you go, 
Uh, it's a reflection of the research community working in the northwest of England and what's important to them amongst this mass of uh, data. What I would say is that it was uh, separate. Uh, those research questions are divided into, I think it's six or seven groups. So you could take those groups as a sort of, uh, as the higher level questions, everything from agriculture and farming through to uh, sort of manufacturing and, and sort of uh, uh, defense and material culture and uh, overseas links. That's a fairly standard way that's been developed by uh, over the last 30, 40 years of approaching that mass of data in archaeology and the historic environment by Historic England, CADU, Historic Environment Scotland. It's a system that works but involves a reasonable amount of uh, effort and support. Uh, and we had financial support from Historic England to do that. So it was a specifically funded Historic England uh, project. And we called upon the time, uh, the personal time of a lot of the people who participated. So we were fortunate enough to include in the second iteration of the research framework back in 1718, a number of uh, archaeology professionals from universities and museums and archaeological units who'd recently retired and were willing to give their, um, their time. This, uh, just to finish off with a second way of getting at uh, uh, this mass of data, uh, taking one theme, one, one of those questions, uh, how do workers' housing develop? Uh, it's possible to use, and, I have, and I've done this, the 30-odd developer-funded reports from the centre of Manchester, those are all the dots there, to look at how workers' housing in the 18th and 19th century in, mass, in Manchester changed and evolved, and actually reflecting that back with contemporary, uh, the contemporary record, we, we happen to have this gentleman, Frederick Engels, who gave a critique of Manchester's workers' housing in the 1840s, pointing out the worst areas and some issues uh, about, some, uh, about that housing from overcrowding to lack of sanitation, uh, poor ventilation, poor, poor building, disease-ridden, immigrant occupied. Is it possible for archaeology using that mass of data to say something about this? Yes, it is. Um, immigration is harder to spot in the material culture. Uh, but overcrowding is very easy to spot in terms of the volume of archaeological sites excavated and the different types of housing and how close they are together. Uh, same with build quality and ventilation. It's possible to look at the uh, foundations of these houses and, and look at how well or badly they've been built. And in terms of sanitation and disease, that's all about drainage and sewage management. Uh, and the juxtaposition of wells by, uh, by toilets and bakeries by toilets, it's possible to do that. And of course, as we're starting to see increasingly, examination of human remains from the 18th and 19th centuries and the pathology those bones contain, which reflect life in the industrial city. It's possible to do all that, bringing all that data together. Um, and just to finish off... Uh, this grey literature, this developer-funded material, is very good at detailed data recovery. It's good at, at using new technologies. It's, it's good at resource and time management on site, so we get a lot of data. Um, and in urban areas, we get intense studies of a single place. It grabs people's attentions, particularly from the industrial period. And it generates fine skills and knowledge. Perhaps uh, what it's less good at is allowing space for synthesis of, of the landscape and monument types, for theoretical discussion, and for retaining these key skills, particularly in industrial archaeology, the churnover, as we know, of professional archaeologists, the burnout in, in the, when people hit their 30s is quite high. So as industrial archaeologists, we tell a particular story. We have a particular way of telling that story through the physical remains of the archaeology. What we have is this fantastic resource of grey literature material able to tell us individual and community stories of the 18th, 19th and early 20th centuries if we have 
the ability to crunch that data. And those stories can be quite different to the perceptions, rather like the Iron Age transition story we just heard about. They can be quite different to the common perceptions out there. But it comes down to money and time to allow us to do that. Thank you.